A lot of you regular viewers may have noticed that in the past year or so I haven't been making as many videos. That's because I've been really involved in product development for a startup company that I'm creating called Playative. Now Playative is dedicated to making science education kits and tools to help the children of the world learn the thing I'm most passionate about, which is science and engineering. So one of the products we decided that was really important to have in our lineup is a solar tracker kit. So here is my design take on a solar tracker concept. It's an energy harvesting solar tracker, which means that it requires no batteries or power source. It basically uses these garden variety one watt solar panels, some discrete electronics and a little cheapy DC motor to create what I consider a pretty pretty nice concept for a solar tracker. The chassis of the thing is basically made out of uh, all laser cut MDF parts that just break out of a sheet and are easily assembled together into this mechanism here and it has this little sort of clutch mechanism that allows you to position it at a particular angle and then and you drop it in, engage the gear, it will then track into the sun and follow it. So you can test it out by putting it at a weird angle and watch it track into the sun. So I've really enjoyed this. It was one of those challenges that I put upon myself that is kind of quirky and interesting, but I, I set very high standards for the results I wanted. And I think you'll agree in the end, it's, it's a pretty cool design. So watch and enjoy. So while I was pondering this project, I thought, let's dive into the YouTube rabbit hole and look at all of the weird stuff that other people do. So here we are. There's a million of these Arduino and LDR based designs out there. They work, but they're just not very inspired. A lot of these even have solar panels on them, but they're strictly decorative and aspirational. And that's not my style. I found this one simple design that I think is just ridiculously cute. It's just two solar panels that are soldered back to back across a DC gear motor. When the sunlight shines on only one of the solar cells, it drives it in that direction. But when the sun is equal on both of them, the voltages cancel and it stays put. Pretty clever. This got me thinking. How could we use two small solar panels to both power the motor in the direction that we wanted to go and at the same time figure out which one was brighter so we knew which way to turn the motor. So after marinating my brain in YouTube weirdness for a while, I thought it was a good time to actually write up some specifications. No great project ever gets anywhere unless you have a good clear outline of where you're going from the start. So first things first, our sun only moves 15 degrees per hour across the sky. That's actually not that much. So that means if the mechanical load we're driving is reasonably well balanced, it's really not doing that much real mechanical work. Firstly, our design needs to be really cheap. We don't have a budget for any third party stuff like an Arduino, ESP32, or any single board computer. It's gotta be really simple. No computer, no real time clock, no GPS, none of that. It can't have any external power source or batteries. It's got to be a totally passive solar tracker. It's got to be able to work well with a really cheap, dumb, simple DC brushed motor, like the kind you get with the cheapest Chinese toys. It should use the same cells for both sun tracking and as the power source. It's a true energy harvesting device. It should be able to reset itself in the morning using just the sky glow alone. This means it's got to be really good at converting feeble amounts of sunlight into useful energy to drive the motor. 
The light sensors and energy source should have a 180 degree field of view for that dawn to dusk reset function. Basically, no matter where it's pointing in the sky, it should be able to get enough light the next morning to start up and reset. It should be really mechanically simple. Just a dirt simple sensor configuration and a DC motor to turn it. The motor should produce enough torque to rotate a really crude mechanism that has crappy bearings and gears that are made out of wood, which it actually has. Finally, we have the secondary design criteria. Firstly, I wanted to make it all through hole so that we can possibly make it a DIY soldering kit as needed. It should also be a completely discrete design. So there's some teachable electronics involved, not just some black boxes and chips. The concept of energy harvesting is really hot these days. There's a lot of companies out there making new chips and pieces of technology to facilitate this idea. But what does it really mean? Typically, it's all about taking some really low-level source of energy that's generated by some ambient condition, like light or vibration or heat, and then accumulating it and integrating it over time to the point where you have enough energy to do something useful and meaningful in a short burst. So typically, this involves storing energy in a capacitor and then releasing it into a circuit at periodic intervals. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Our cheap little gear motor spins at about 30 RPM when supplied with 3 volts. If we take a small electrolytic capacitor, around 1000 microfarads, charge it to 24 volts, and then discharge it into the motor, it happily rotates a few degrees. So how do we charge a capacitor from a solar panel whose output ranges from 0 volts maybe to 5.5 volts under full sun? We need a boost converter, and we need a boost converter that can start up and run efficiently at really low voltages, so we can produce a viable motor movement even from the vanishingly small amount of solar energy available at dawn. I've researched some of the energy harvesting chips out there, but they all seem to be designed around charging lithium ion batteries and operating at quite low system voltages, like 3.3 or 5. None of them seem to do anything in the range of 24 volts. Not to mention that these parts are really complicated. They're also expensive, hard to find, and come in the usual surface mount package. Totally not applicable to this project. Then an idea popped into my head. Why not use something as simple as a jewel thief circuit to do the job? These circuits are famous for operating from really low input voltages. Now the architecture of our idea is starting to shape up a bit. We use a solar cell and a boost converter to charge a capacitor to 24 volts. Periodically, we discharge this capacitor into the motor to produce little spurts of movement. To automate this process, we add a voltage detector that detects when the capacitor is fully charged. This makes it basically a free-running oscillator that pulses the motor whenever the capacitor is charged. So now, as long as there's enough light to start up that boost converter, that motor's going to move. And it's going to move with the same torque that it has under full sun, because it's getting basically the pulse of the same voltage no matter what. This lowers our threshold for movement to a very low level. So how do we make the system actually track the sun now? Well, we take two identical circuits, each with its own solar panel, boost converter, and storage capacitor. We connect the two outputs together in a diode or configuration to a common power bus. This power bus feeds an H-bridge, which allows the motor to be turned in either direction, depending on which input is triggered. In operation, both capacitors charge simultaneously, but at slightly different rates. The one that reaches the threshold voltage first triggers the H-bridge. The H-bridge powers the motor from the common bus, which discharges the energy from both capacitors to power the motor. So we're effectively using the energy from both systems to power the motor. We configure the system to rotate the tracker in the direction that brings the solar cell with a lower illumination more into the beam of light as it turns. This tracker lacks any dead band, so it will always be hunting. 
It's a razor's edge between turn left and turn right. So at every decision, it will always be hunting back and forth, trying to maintain the perfect position. For the purposes of optimizing a solar cell output, the angle of this hunt is minimal and totally ignorable. One thing you should immediately notice looking at the schematic is the symmetry. We have two connectors for the solar panels at the top and a single motor connector at the bottom. If we take a detailed look at one side of this circuit, the operation of the hole will become very obvious. We'll start with our Jewel Thief boost converter circuit. Now I can't resist dropping a little tip here. If you want to experiment with these Jewel Thief circuits, conventional wisdom will have you winding your own toroid. But you can spare yourself a lot of grief here by just using a simple off-the-shelf common mode choke. The winding setup is perfect. In fact, it's really easy to figure out the phasing so you don't have to swap the leads twice just to get it to work. You can easily scrounge these from almost any piece of mains powered gear you find these days. And now back to our circuit. The output taken from C2 kind of looks like a crappy current source. The output current drops as the voltage rises. This is a result of the inductor transferring energy on each cycle. As the output voltage rises, the current decreases. The main path for charging the energy storage capacitor is through R4 and D14. As the voltage on the capacitor rises, current flow through the base of Q3 into resistor R1 would eventually cause Q3 and Q1, which are connected as an SCR, to trigger into a conduction mode. But this won't happen while the capacitor is charging because D1 keeps the base of Q3 at a high enough voltage that it's actually slightly reverse biased. This occurs because the main charging current that flows through D14 is much greater than the small bias current that flows through D1. This makes the voltage drop across D1 therefore smaller. This bias current also represents the main source of parasitic energy loss while the capacitor is charging. Nothing much happens until the voltage on the capacitor starts to get near 24 volts. That's when Q4 and D4 come into play. When the voltage on Q4's emitter reaches about 24.6 volts, diode D4 begins to break down and conduct. This base current flowing in Q4 causes it to start conducting. This conduction shunts current away from D14 and R4, which has the net result of making Q3's emitter voltage rise slightly relative to the base. If the base emitter junction is forward biased, it will begin to conduct through R1. This base current causes collector current to flow in Q3, which then in turn turns on Q1, which then pulls an even greater current out of Q3's base. This is a regenerative action. It causes both transistors to slam into hard conduction, which quickly brings the voltage divider formed by R2 and R3 up to 24 volts. The output of this voltage divider drives a little circuit consisting of D3, C3, and R6. The purpose of this circuit is to extend the gate drive on Q5 long enough to make sure that all the energy is sucked completely out of the two energy storage capacitors. When Q5 is turned on, it pulls current through R9, which turns on the opposing high side transistor Q7. This creates a path for motor current to flow from both storage capacitors through the two diodes into the motor. So now you can also see that when the opposite side circuit triggers, that is when Q8 turns on, the same exact deal happens, but the current through the motor is reversed, so it will rotate in the opposite direction. So once the capacitors are finally discharged, we want this whole thing to reset and start over. But there's one tricky problem. The whole while all this was going on, the boost converters are still supplying current to the whole show. So we have to be sure that the SCR pair does not remain on, because if it did, it would just get stuck like that and never charge and never fire. The only way we can shut off that SCR pair is either by interrupting the current completely 
or by reverse biasing one of the junctions. This is again where D1 comes into play. As long as the voltage is well below 24 volts and Q4 doesn't conduct, D1 ensures that the base of Q3 is at a slightly higher voltage and therefore cut off. This ensures that whenever the circuit is charging, that SCR pair is forced into an off condition. So it will always restart for the next cycle. There's still one tiny little problem that remains to be solved. We need to make sure that both of these circuits cannot fire at the same time. This is actually a bigger problem than you might think, because when they're both near 24 volts, things get pretty sensitive and twitchy. So it doesn't take much for the opposite side to be induced to fire at the same time. This causes a direct short, wastes all the energy, and is very undesirable. The solution to this problem comes in the form of two capacitors, C1 and C10. These capacitors prevent both sides from triggering by cross-coupling a positive going trigger signal from the output of one into the voltage detector circuit of the other. If we imagine a positive going pulse coming into C1 from the opposite side, we can see how that would immediately cause the voltage on R1 to rise. This rise in voltage would immediately cut Q3 off by reverse biasing its base emitter junction, which prevents it from triggering. We place the tracker in a location that would see a full day's unshadowed sun from dawn to dusk. It's pretty windy there, so we had to put rocks down to hold the thing from blowing away. In the morning, I was surprised to see that the reflection off the tiles was stronger than the sky glow. So this tracker reset by turning towards the ground rather than towards the sky. I then tried the tracker on the ledge of my building, a place where it would receive direct sunlight for a small portion of the afternoon, followed by a wide range of indirect lighting conditions as the day progressed. It's cool to watch it transition from tracking the actual sun to following the general centroid of the bright spot in the sky above it. As dusk approaches, you can see the tracking slow down as the light levels decrease. So I hope you all had as much fun watching this video as I had designing this. It was a really fun project and it kind of makes me want to make a full-size version and see if I can drive a real solar array with a passive tracker like this. So if you want more information about Playative and our products, check the link in the description below. And as always, I hope you learned and enjoyed. Until next time, thank you all for watching.